All right, um, we'll get started now. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please send them via the Q&A button and we will address them at the end. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, the past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club and a prolific author in her own right. Ashley has brought numerous gardening experts to the library over the past year uh, to help teach us all a manner of to help teach us all manner of creating the best gardens that we can. Today she is here with Holly Samuels. So now please welcome Ashley. Thank you, Matt. And isn't it nice to come in from the hot garden today and listen to a lecture and sit underneath the air conditioner? I must say, I was out there earlier and thinking, okay, I can't wait to get inside. Uh, Holly Samuels has been on before and people really loved her presentation. And I have worked with her on redoing the Monroe Tavern Garden. And she is active in Lexington conservation for the last five years. She's a landscape designer, which keeps her awfully busy and she's now a conservation commissioner. And basically what her vision is how to keep, what home, homeowners can do to attract pollinators, to make a more beautiful garden, to make it just wonderful and suit the world as it is now. As it is now is hundred degrees and we have to really worry about that these days. So Holly, you are on, go for it, my dear. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm going to start my, to share my screen so you can uh, see my slide. Get the right screen. Okay, are you seeing my, my uh, hummingbird? I don't see it on there. I do. You do? Okay. Right, great. I see it in, um, it's not in presenter mode. I think you just hit present at the top. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there you go. Oh, now, gorgeous. Beautiful. It's such nice slides. I'm hoping to see this actually in my yard uh, very soon because my bivon, which is the picture of, um, are starting to bloom, although mine are the raspberry variety, so they're hot pink, um, and the hummingbirds just love them. So today, uh, I hope you're inside in a cool place to watch this presentation. And I want to share some information about having wildlife visit your yard. Some wildlife uh, you may want to encourage and how to do that. And some you may not want to encourage and how not to do that. Yes. And I'll also share a little bit why this is an important thing to do environmentally. Aside from the enjoyment you can personally receive from it, this would be great. Um, so. Clarify what types of wildlife you'd like to attract to your yard. I actually mentioned pollinators, and that's certainly important. Um, but there are some other types of, of, uh, of wildlife that you might like to see. Um, for instance, uh, you may have uh, a little bit of wet area, and you can attract some salamanders or newts or some frogs or some turtles. Um, and First birds and butterflies and moths are all wonderfully welcome visitors to the garden. Then there are types of wildlife that many of us are not so- Holly, could I interrupt? Yes, please. Um, there's, there's a little bit of uh, issue with the mic, the microphone. I'm not sure if you're able to just adjust the volume. It could be the thing that you're using that's taking out the background noise. Okay, so if I speak a little louder, will that work? That's because better, I think. I don't know if I can't adjust the volume. I'm just the better if, if you come closer to the. Okay. okay. Um, so there are some kind of wildlife that we may not want to see in our yard, or we may see and want to keep a distance from. Um, the first, of course, that we have in Lexington in great numbers is the rabbit population. Uh, we mostly see these eastern cottontail rabbits, which have been migrating to New England from the southern states since about 1900. Uh, and there's a picture of them here. Um, I think it's Dixie's revenge on us northern gardeners. <laughs> because they, as we know, they, they have, they're really voracious. And they'll eat just about anything. 
I'll talk a little bit later about uh, the plants that they don't seem to like. Um, some of us have the white-tailed deer when they're, we're a little closer to woodlands, that, and they'll also eat just about anything. And don't get me started about wood shops. This little fellow down here, right here. Oh my goodness. So a whole family of them moved in across the street, and now my vegetable plants are being decimated. They seem to like the leaves on the cucumbers and the squash. So I've had to put a barricade around them. Um, then this year, um, let's see, I'm on my fourth iteration of fence. Okay. Some of the other animals may make a visit from time to time in your yard, as they are all in Lexington. So we may see raccoons, we may see coyotes, we may see even these. Uh, these nasty little fisher cats, which are really uh, apex predators kind of, um, and can cause some concern if we're living near to wildlands. Um, keeping the garbage well covered can help keep them away, um, but generally they don't cause a problem. Just be aware and keep your distance um, and keep your pets uh, under your watchful eye uh, because they are wild animals and they can be very unpredictable. Um, their raccoons can carry rabies. Uh, so you want to be aware and just watch them from a distance. And if, you, if they're coming into your yard and it's something you want and you can enjoy them, then enjoy them. In some cases, you may need to do some fencing to keep them out of your yard. And of course, uh, these are the two that people seem to be most worried about as they can carry diseases. Um, However, we also have to be aware that spraying for them also kills every other insect in your yard, including beneficial insects. So I'll talk a little bit more about these, these impacts later on, but I know these are mosquitoes and ticks are always at the forefront of people's minds when they start wanting to do a little more natural gardening. We have to remember that we are a part of nature. It's a vast web of life from the microbial life in the soil and the water to the apex predators of which we human beings have become the most numerous and actually the most dangerous to other life forms. It seems that many of us can't really understand that we need to learn together, to live together for our own survival. So it's really important to keep this, this is at the back of my mind all the time. Um, we don't wanna end up having to pollinate our own food because we've sprayed so much to kill some insects that we've killed them all. Uh, people, oh, so, Sorry, I'm, I'm running, <laughs> I'm trying to run two screens here, so I forgot to, to, to advance, here we go. So this, people have been talking about this, that in, in China, places in China, they have to pollinate fruit trees by hand um, because there have been so much spraying for insects that there are no more pollinators anymore. We don't, so we don't wanna end up in this condition. We, we spend millions and millions of dollars importing uh, honeybees uh, by truck into various kinds of uh, almond groves and, and other pollinating, uh, sorry, trees that need to be pollinated. Um, so we have to be aware that we need these insects very much for our own survival. And we don't want to have the whole food chain collapse um, because we're spraying for insects. So what's most threatening to wildlife? Uh, the most, besides spraying for insects and other pests, development of wild areas is the most threatening thing for wildlife because they're simply running out of places to live. Uh, one of the articles I've been following lately are, is about uh, wildlife overpasses and underpasses that they're beginning to build in states so that animals can get from one section to another that's been cut in half by a super highway and then you know, they die as they try to cross the highway. If animals can't get from one side to the other of a highway, they begin to limit their range. And then their populations uh, begin to be inbred. And then they're more, more apt to have uh, diseases and, and have less chance of survival. So this habitat is really uh, decreasing quite a bit due to human development. Um, here's a, here's a, uh, an aerial view of Lexington Center in 2018, just the center. And you can see the grid of, of there are a lot of trees, true, but the grid of houses uh, and streets just in this small area is pretty, um, is pretty dense. And then I hope this doesn't insult anybody, it's nobody's yard, but um, this is a sampling of, of real estate photos of homes in Lexington. 
uh, fairly recently uh, from online. And you can see that the, these yards are lawn uh, dominated um, and there may be a few trees in the backyard, but this is not wildlife friendly habitat. Um, lawn, which tends to be managed by uh, chemicals and mowed by, by lawn mowers that are polluting the air. It's not uh, a way to invite uh, wildlife into your yard and, and start to sort of be a homeowner that can begin to support some of this wildlife habitat. Um, so how can we support it? Uh, well, wildlife needs habitat to provide. So habitat includes three main things. It includes food, water and safety. And it can also be beautiful. As you can see from these, these pictures, uh, you can have a lovely front yard. It can even look fairly formal um, uh, in the design, um, but still be very wildlife friendly. So let's first talk about how to attract the uh, birds in your yard, which are uh, everybody's favorite because they don't seem to do too much damage. You can enjoy them. So I have a pretty dense slide here, but it has a lot of uh, plants that birds really uh, enjoy, particularly for their food. So, and their seeds and their fruits. So I've also given you the link on the bottom of this slide to the Audubon Society page with lots more plants for attracting specific types of birds, like if you're looking for attracting songbirds. Mm. One of the key principles in attracting birds to your yard is to provide food sources throughout the year. So in my small yard, which is perched at the top of the hill and tends to be rather dry, I have three service berry trees, which are small native trees that typically grow at the edge of the woods. They have berries in June that are edible to birds and people. I forget the birds, but I let the birds have them. They are bland tasting, but you can eat them. This year they fed, uh, in the past year, a few years, they fed the robins and blue jays. Last year I saw a whole, had a whole flock of cedar waxwings come in. And this year I saw the first Baltimore park in my yard. Mm. Yeah. And they go mad over these. And they, they have to sort of uh, uh, fly and kind of like hang in the air <laughs> as they grab the berries. Some of them are not so easy to get. It's, it's kind of fun to watch. I also have three types of viburnum bushes um, that produce berries for the birds in July. So I have a viburnum, for those of you that are taking notes, <laughs> viburnum dentatum, which is the arrowwood viburnum, a nice big uh, shrub. Um, a couple of viburnum trilobum, which are which get, get to be like small trees, and gorgeous red berries. Um, and um, um, a marisa viburnum, which is a placatum viburnum. Uh, which also gets berries. And they also have gorgeous fall foliage. So these are wonderful shrubs for, for attracting birds to your yard. Uh, my neighbor has two enormous elderberry bushes. Elderberries are, are sambucus, um, are native to the wetlands around here. They tend to grow on the edge of a wetland in full sun. Um, but she has these bushes that are in part shade um, in my neighborhood, which is quite dry. So they're, although they, they naturally find uh, wet places to live, you can also grow them in, in areas that are not wet. Uh, they do get quite large. Berries are great for eating and for the birds. Well, birds love the seeds of flowers, like sunflowers and cone flowers. My cone flowers attract lots of goldfinches later in the fall. And birds also go for the seeds of our native grasses and trees. So learn to use these plants in your yard. Start by planting a small garden that you can view from your window, patio, or deck to see who starts to visit. Now, hummingbirds are a favorite because they're they're so they're so neat to watch. Um, in July, the, the native ruby-throated hummingbirds start appearing. So, as I said earlier, I have these mass, these big mass of hot pink blue bomb that just started to flower now. And I can't wait to hear that very distinctive buzz they make when they're flying around. So it's a it's it's different than a bee, it's just a, a deep buzz for anyone who heard it. Um, and, and then they just stop at the flower and you could just hover in the air. And it's so fascinating to watch them. And if they're comfortable in your yard, uh, they'll even perch and stop for a while. Um, and you can see from these uh, the shapes of the flowers that the flowers 
that they like correspond to the shape of their beak and they have a long tongue, uh, which can go right down into the throat uh, uh, and sip the nectar. I, th I think it's really fascinating how these creatures have evolved to coexist with each other by carving out these different niches in the food chain. Other birds can't do this. They can't access the nectar because um, they're not built this way. You can also see that the hummingbirds like the color red, but they also go for hot pink. And once they're in the vicinity, uh, drawn by these colors, they'll try anything that they can get their tongues into, like the salmon or gloves or anything like that. So, I for hummingbirds, actually, go ahead. Holly, excuse me. Um, yeah. People are still having problems with your um, the quality right. of the voice. Let me try turning off my air conditioner. Hang on. Okay. Okay. To have this is that different? Yeah, I speak loudly. Okay. That's, that, that's better. Is that better? Okay. Sorry, I misled you in the beginning. because If I start to turn fine. red and slide off the screen, you'll know what happened. <laughs> I'm sitting in my computers in the south facing front of my house, and um, it can get pretty hot in here, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, so you have to also remember, as you're thinking about feeding birds, and if you've read any of the work by Doug Palamy or heard of his work, uh, you'll know that Doug Palamy is an entomologist who talks about the importance of, of insects in feeding uh, birds to, um, that many birds are insect eaters. And most birds rear their young on this protein rich, soft, squishy caterpillars that they can just cram down the throats of their hungry chicks. And they, they need thousands of them for each family of baby birds, each nest of baby birds. Um, so why not plant for caterpillars? And you can see on this list that trees are by far the biggest source for caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And not only do birds tend to nest where the caterpillars are more abundant, we also get to see the butterflies and moths that were able to evade the birds. So look at that, an oak, uh, can support so many, like 534 species of insects that uh, that will lay their eggs because the young can eat the oak leaves, and then the birds come. And there's like this, it's it just not just one caterpillar at a time. But look at the robin. Yes. All caterpillars. Um. So, you know, we we have to remember that side. You know, it's also providing these host plants, just like the um, the monarch butterfly. Uh, only lays its eggs on a specific plant, the milkweed, um, because that's the only plant that the larva will eat the leaves of. They've co-evolved that way. Um, these, the, the trees here support many, many species, but there are many plants that only support, uh, that have a one-to-one -one relationship with support. Or some, some insects uh, just use certain plants um, for, uh, for food, like the black swallowtail, uh, sorry, not the black swallowtail. It's the spice bush uh, butterfly, which which feeds on the spice bush, uh, Lindira mm -hmm. benzoin. Interesting. Yeah. So there's this, this really interesting and complex one-to-one uh, -one relationship. And if you haven't read this book, Bringing Nature Home, and his new book, uh, which I can't remember the name of, if someone remembers, put it in the chat. Uh, but really encouraging homeowners to support nature by planting foods that are host plants uh, for these, um, these insects. Okay, now many people will say that they have a bird feeder and that's how I attract birds into my yard. So um, I, um, I was once a bird feeder person, but um, I no longer am. And I'm gonna show you a couple of reasons why uh, it may not be the best idea in the world. <laughs> I like bears. <laughs> Although if you, if, you, if you have success with this and it's fine for you, it's no problem. But I just want to tell you a few downsides um, that I've found. Um, I used to have two seed bird feeders, one for hummingbirds with sugar water and a suet feeder. So the chipmunks, like this fellow here, used to come and clean out the seed feeders in about 10 minutes. <laughs> with two or three trips, looking just like this guy with the bulging cheeks, and he would just squirrel away his food or chipmunk away his food uh, uh, underground. Um, and then the grackles would come, these guys here, and they would clear it out, uh, making a racket and scaring all the other birds away. 
And then the neighbor cats would be very happy to prowl around just waiting to nab a bird. I love this one, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen a cat in a bird feeder, but this guy's are definitely ready. Um, so that it can attract uh, these uh, prowlers. Yes. And one winter, um, I, I saw what I thought were three baby squirrels running up and down the pole uh, uh, with very skinny tails. And I thought they were little baby squirrels because they, maybe their tails hadn't gotten bushy yet. But then I, then I realized that they were three rats that were running up and down um, and feeding at my, my bird feeder. Um, and so some kind of primal, <laughs> primal instinct uh, kicked in and I, I down came the feeders and I stopped putting food in my compost bin and there were no more rats. Now there was some, there was road construction on Mass Ave and some people were saying that maybe that was kind of prompting this rat, but I, these were apparently field rats. They weren't like the big Norway rats you see in the city, but, um, but there's a certain kind of creepy feeling when rats are, are feeding on your bird feeder. So they went back to where they came from. And I took down the hummingbird feeders when ants and wasps were getting trapped and drowned in there. And the suet feeders came down when the grackles and crows cleaned them out um, in one morning visit. So it was much easier for me. No need to clean anything, no dangerous microbial activity from mold, uh, no cost of bird seed. Um, and except for the rat rats, which are gone, thank goodness, the same creature visits come, but at a more natural pace. Um, and because they're attracted to my natural grocery in the form of living plants, um, they're also having uh, a beneficial impact to the ecosystem. So I've got this wonderful natural grocery going on for them and benefiting the environment at the same time. I don't have to pay for bird seed or deal with cleaning all, all the messes. So that's my story about, about bird feeders. Um, another way to support insects uh, is to use plants that are native to our region. Um, because the co of the co-evolution of plants and insects in any particular region of the world, the insects tend to be drawn uh, to particular types of plants, both for food sources and for host plants to support their young. So although the insects will feed from the nectar of many plants, many will only lay their eggs on native plants because the larvae, they just can't digest the leaves of other plants like the monarch butterfly. Um, so incorporating a variety of plants native to our region is a great way to have a buffet uh, for many different kinds of insects. And additionally, we can think about the form of the flowers we have in our gardens. So people who develop new varieties of plants uh, for a living like to make the most simple flowers, uh, like to make the visits to the most simple flowers. Sorry, let me help, hang on a minute here. Let me separate this a little bit so I can see a little better. Um, so these hybridizers like to develop flowers that are very complex, like these double flowers that you see. So many flowers uh, in their natural form are in singles, like this chrysanthemum on the screen here, um, where you can see the stamens and the anthers and the, the bees uh, and butterflies can know where to go for food. Um, but when they're, they're hybridized to the point where they're so double that they can't, the insects can't figure out where to go to get what they're looking for, they just avoid them. So they're not supporting the insect population. Hmm. Um, so among your gorgeous double dahlias like mine that are coming up right now, um, try to add in some single simple flowers uh, for the insects. And while you're at it, uh, think about using plants uh, that have a variety of bloom time so that you can support insects all throughout the, the growing season. Oh, so for example, um, something that extends the bloom season is the witch hazel. The native witch hazel, Hamamillus virginiana, um, blooms in late fall around here. Um, there are some other varieties uh, like Arnold Promise, which is not a native. It's a hybrid of uh, Asian and a, a Chinese and a Japanese variety, um, but it also bloom. I have one that I love. I have both the, the native and um, this hybrids. Um, because the, the Arnold Promise blooms uh, early March, sometimes late February. And 
and uh, and then the native uh, Hemimelis virginiana blooms at the other end of the year, October to December, and they're they're providing some food for the insect population. Besides which, they're beautiful, very cheering for us, and have a wonderful fragrance. So if you have one that's near a home, uh, it's fantastic. Um, so from early spring, snowdrops, daffodils, crocuses, and others early and others uh, bulbs all the way to fall with asters, um, mums, a monk's hood, witch hazels. Um, there can be living plants in your yard uh, that are attracting pollinators and supporting the, the native insect population, uh, including flies uh, that, uh, that are all looking for food. So you can, you can extend it by starting to add some of these plants to your yard. Um, the other thing you can do is you can support insects with a really big meal because they're really attracted to drifts and masses of plants rather than just the, the single plant um, in a mulch bed uh, with lots of mulch around it. So if you can, uh, if, if, you're if you're gardening this way, uh, you may want to start to think about seeing if you can stretch your comfort level <laughs> to uh, mass your plants a little more and maybe put in three or five of something to create a large area of one plant that will then really attract uh, the birds and the insects that are, that are flying by rather than much more easily than just one plant. And when you garden this way, um, it eliminates, eventually eliminates the need for mulch. Um, it keeps the weeds down and give shelter and safety to insects, birds, and other wildlife. Um, it looks pretty, it's easier to manage, and it's less expensive to manage. So a lot of pluses there. So the other way you can uh, provide some safety and shelter in your yard um, is to start to think about how insects and animals overwinter, because a lot of the, the insects will, will burrow into the leaf litter um, to overwinter. And if we start blowing out everything that's in our beds, uh, in our planting beds, um, you're going to eliminate any kind of, of habitat for safety for those insects for reproduction and overwintering. So if you can bear it, uh, leave the litter yard, leave the litter, the leaf litter in your garden beds, uh, at least some of them, and it doesn't have to be everywhere. And you probably want to rake your lawn. Uh, or get the leaves off your lawn because they will, they will have an impact on your lawn. Um, but at least some areas of your yard, if you can leave that leaf uh, litter in there, if your neighbors aren't gonna complain, um, then, uh, and you can hold off on cutting down the stems of some of the grasses and the sturdier perennials. Um, those seed heads provide a source of food for, for birds all winter long. And some of them for, for birds that are migrating up in the spring, um, it's a food source for them. Um, like the, for instance, the cone flower. So I, for me, I just rake the leaves off my lawn into my flower beds and I leave them there. And there's so many plants in there. I'll show you some pictures at the end of what I, how I, how I deal with plantings in my yard. Um, that the, the plants just sort of keep the leaves there. It's not that they're blowing all into the neighbor's yard. Um, if you have large leaves like oak or maple, um, you may want to start, uh, you may want to make a leaf compost pile out of them somewhere in the corner. Um, they tend to, they can, they can mat down a bed. So uh, you may want to take those off a little later. Um, but in any case, you should rake out your beds uh, late in April. People say when the maples start to bloom is a good time to start to take off that leaf cover in your, in your garden beds. Um, so, and, and one, one insect that we never see anymore, except for in big meadows and places, is the fi fireflies. And fireflies uh, overwinter in this leaf litter. So if you, I, I haven't seen any in my yard. Because my yard is very small, so I'm not sure there's enough area to attract them. But, um, but if you have a larger area, you might be, even see some fireflies in the summer. Mm -hmm. And some of the, uh, some of the insects um, nest in these uh, stems of plants. So if you want to cut down some of your plants and leave some of the stems, they have to be a, a, a certain diameter, and I can't remember when this is fairly small, but a certain diameter for, for animal for insects to do this. But this first picture is, is of a, a leaf cutter bee. 
Um, and it's actually cut little pieces of leaves to cover over the, the eggs that is laid in this, in this stem. So you might be lucky to see something like that. And also reptiles uh, and some amphibians uh, shelter uh, under leaf piles or into some, some dead wood in your yard. Just keep, if you have dead wood, just keep it away from the house so you don't get any termite or ant infestations. But you can do that. And if you're really ambitious, you can, um, oops, here, sorry. I forgot I put an, an animation on there. Here we go. So if you're really ambitious, uh, you can have a birdhouse or even a bat house, um, which may be creepy for some people, but bats are really in, in, in a precarious position environmentally. And um, they're really necessary, uh, particularly for keeping the, the mosquito population down. Um, but you, there are, and I gave you some, uh, some links here for some, some directions on how to build some of these houses and what the parameters are you can buy buy them as well. So if you're worried about mosquitoes, encourage these guys to visit your yard. Um, every evening when it starts in dusk, I see swallows flying around in my neighborhood and they're out there looking for mosquitoes. They love the mosquitoes. Hummingbirds will eat the mosquitoes. Uh, any kind of frogs or newts or salamanders even dragonflies. I get dragonflies in my yard. I don't hardly have any water. I'll show you my water feature <laughs> in my yard, but I get dragonflies come in and, um, and they eat mosquitoes and, and bats eat mosquitoes, as I said. So um, that's a natural way to handle some of these problems that everybody's very worried about. Let me give you a little more information on this here. And uh, if you're worried about ticks, uh, these are the places that ticks can live. So big wild areas where the woods and fields meet lawn um, and in some wooded areas and in tall brush and grass. Um, they can live under leaves, um, but very small numbers of them live on cut or raked lawns or sports fields, places like that. Um, they can live under ground cover plants in a yard and they can live around stone walls and wood piles where mice and other mammals live. So you have to be alert in these areas. You do tick checks. Um, if you go into these areas that are that are wild like this, you wear you can wear pyrethrum treated clothing. Pyrethrum is an, is an insecticide made from chrysanthemum uh, and it will keep them from attaching to you. Um, but uh, I work in, in the conservation areas in town, as, both as a steward and, and I visit all kinds of wild areas and my work as, work as a conservation commissioner. Um, so what do I do to prevent tick bites? I uh, take the attaching, I wear long pants with my socks tucked into the pants and I check myself after I've been in these places. I stay out of tall grass as much as possible. And I'm gonna knock on wood, can you hear me? I haven't had, I haven't seen any ticks on me in five years of frequenting these areas. But that doesn't mean I don't keep protecting myself and keeping my eyes open. I've never had a tick in my yard on me and my yard is filled with plants. Um, so be alert and be careful, but please think twice about spraying your yard for insects. Um, I, I, I saw this ad and I, <laughs> I thought it was very, um, very telling. So note what the ad says that ortho bug clear insect killer for lawns and gardens is a one stop solution to keep ticks and other pests out of your yard for up to six months. Sounds great. Not only does it work on ticks, it also kills 235 different types of insects in total, including species of fleas, mosquitoes, ants and spiders. So now lumping every single insect together is like lumping every single person together and saying that all people are the same. Um, they're not all the same. They have different uh, places in the, in the ecosystem and to kill them all is, is like making a death sentence for humanity. So please don't try to kill all the insects in your yard. If you're that worried about insects, I mean, maybe apartment living is a better solution for you, truly, because it's, it's really not the right thing to do. Things that are toxic to wildlife, insecticides, herbicides, any poisons. 
So if you can, manage your lawn organically. Uh, there are a number of different uh, lawn care companies that will manage your lawn organically and, um, and mean, which means you don't have to keep your children or your pets off the lawn. Uh, if you see um, uh, a dandelion in your lawn, you don't have to spray it with something that's then going to kill everything else or put these pre-emergent uh, uh, herbicides in your lawn. Just get a dandelion weeder and dig it out. <laughs> it really isn't, isn't that hard. Um, inviting wildlife into your garden means a different relationship with nature. It's one of cooperating supporting and managing rather than controlling or eliminating. Um, it, it means inviting clover into your grass because it supports pollinators like bees and it doesn't require as much water as turf grass. I have a small lawn, but I had a big infestation of annual crabgrass, which I don't like the look of and it dies and it looks terrible in the yard. It's an annual. So it dies, but then it will reseed the next year. But then they sell all kinds of pre-emergent crabgrass uh, herbicide to keep it from, from um, it doesn't keep it from sprouting, but it sprouts and it can't take root. So I didn't want to use those. So I found that uh, corn gluten is a natural uh, pre-emergent um, that keeps roots from forming after the seeds sprout. Now it's a little bit more tricky to use. The timing is important. Um, they say to, I tried it this year for the first time. Uh, they said it, to do it, uh, lay it when the forsythia starts to fade. Um, so I put it in my yard where the, the crabgrass was last year. And um, they say it needs to be a little dry after the application. I don't, I don't think I even paid any attention to that. Um, I used it along a couple of, of paths I have. And so far, uh, there's been no crabgrass in the lawn. It's, it's, and, and there is crabgrass growing in the path. So I know the crabgrass is up, not as much crabgrass in the path that there was last year. But I know the crabgrass has, has germinated. So it, it's, it's worked in the lawn. Um, and it's also a little greener where the corn gluten uh, was, was uh, laid, uh, and uh, uh, presumably because there's a high nitrogen content. So maybe I should put it everywhere. I was thinking in the lawn next year and get the lawn nice and green. Um, and the existing grass, uh, and I've, I've put a lot of compost in my lawn. I hardly ever treat my lawn with anything. Um, I did do some, I, I've added a lot of compost uh, to the lawn. Um, I've overseeded it for a number of years, but not in the last three or four years. And uh, I hardly ever do anything else. And where the existing grass is strong is just filled in where the crabgrass has been for the last few years. So there's a little article link here about uh, using uh, corn gluten and the timing that you need to, to watch out for if you'd like to try that. Then there are a lot of insects that are very beneficial. Uh, they eat insects we don't want that eat our plants. Um, and uh, this is just a couple of them here. And there are a couple of links here to um, one from the Xerxes Society uh, and at one is uh, university to give you some more information about beneficial insects. The ladybug larvae eat the aphids, aphids that suck the life out of our plants. I have a native honeysuckle vine, the uh, Linicera sempervirens that had beautiful apricot flowers that the hummingbirds just love. And the last few years I've had an aphid insect infestation um, and it's right on my porch and it really looks horrible when it's got aphids all over it. Um, so two years ago, I tried spraying with a relatively safe uh, insecticidal soap called Safer, which basically just smothers the aphids. Um, it didn't do much good. And then I realized there were ladybugs on the plants and I had um, chased away the ladybugs with this soap. And I knew that ladybugs eat aphids. So next year I didn't spray. And I saw these very strange looking little bugs um, that turned out to be ladybug larvae. And they were all over them eating the aphids. Now they didn't take care of the problem completely. The aphids still decimated the buds, um, but I didn't spray. So this year there are more aphids and there are more ladybug larvae. And today or yesterday when I made this, I saw the first uh, flower actually blooming um, on new growth after a lot of aphid destruction. I just cut off the parts of the 
vine that were right adjacent to the the path, the um, porch uh, coming into the porch. So I didn't have to look at them. And then the rest of them were sort of dealing and, and maybe they'll eventually be some uh, a big enough ladybug population that they can handle this, these aphids. Um, so it's a large story, this, in, this beneficial uh, insect story. So you can take a look at these links uh, if you want to try them. And you, know, given, you have to give a chance for these things to work. Um, I was gonna make a link to this a movie I saw that I, I, maybe someone will remember the name. I think it's called the biggest, the best little farm in the world, or the biggest little farm in the world. It's about a farm in California. That uh, you can watch this movie free on online. Um, that started out um, sort of battling with with overruns of different kinds of of um, predators on their farm and. They tried a few things and within a number, it took a number of years, but they began to have a balance where, where nature was sort of taking care of itself. And uh, so I think we have to give it a chance um, before we start spraying everything in sight. However, there is another problem that we have around here, which is the invasive plants. And um, I spent a lot of time managing for invasive plants in our conservation areas. Um, and these plants can overwhelm the native plant population because they're relative newcomers to our region, um, as opposed to plants that have co-evolved over thousands of years with our insect population. Some of them like tansy and garlic mustard were brought by European colonists as food and medicine. Others like Japanese knotweed and multiflora rose were brought as ornamentals by 19th century landscape designers and plant hunters. They were very eager to try something exotic and new and happy that these plants had no natural enemies on our shores. Um, even some of your favorite landscape plants like burning bush, Japanese barberry and privet hedge are escapees into our wild areas. And unfortunately, some of them have had so much advantage over native plants that they dominate the landscape with little or no benefit to the local east ecosystem and sometimes quite devastating effects. Um, some of them have ways of keeping other plants from growing around them uh, chemically. Um, sometimes they will, uh, like the, the oriental bittersweet vine will, will basically smother, uh, smother whole trees by creating such canopy of overgrowth that the tree can't photosynthesize. Um, and then trees just fall down so what do we do? So one of the things in, is to just get to know them. Um, and the town website, even if you look up, uh, just look up um, Lexington Mass invasive plant list, um, you'll get links to all the plants that are a problem and, and uh, fact sheets on each one, including removal techniques. And if they're in your yard and unplanted, you can try to remove them. Um, for instance, I, when I first moved into my uh, house, I had this lovely plant that I thought was a great screen and it turned out to be Japanese knotweed. Um, so I let it go for you know year, year or two and then I realized what it was and, and I had to start cutting it and, and treating it. And I don't have, it, I have no problem with, with spot treating uh, with herbicide uh, invasive plants because they're very difficult to remove, especially knotweed, which has a huge underground root system and I still get it up. And I still have to deal with it, little bits of, that aren't that aren't coming out. Um, and I'll show you one in a moment. Uh, if you've got if some of the invasive plants you have, and when I say things like burning bush, um, these plants are no longer legal to be sold in Massachusetts. And many people really love them because they turn such beautiful colors. Uh, so what you can do is consider replacing them with some others that have similar appeal. So for instance, here's your burning bush in the fall, gorgeous. Uh, gorgeous foliage. It's a very tough plant. has no enemies here. Nothing eats it at all, which means it doesn't feed anything um, except the, the, the berries, which do feed birds, which unfortunately then go and spread it all over the woods and it becomes, it becomes a dominant understory plant in the woods. Um, when you hedge clip it, uh, and I've taken care of these, so I know, I know what happens. You hedge clip one, one, uh, branch and you'll get a sprouting of five to seven new um, new branches and so then the shrub keeps getting larger and larger and larger and larger because no no one knows how to head back and cut deep into the plant to open it up and let new growth come and keep it smaller 
So they get enormous, these plants. Um, I've seen them 15, 20 feet tall. Um, so how about replacing it with red chokeberry, Aronia arbutifolia? Uh, it also has gorgeous fall color. It has pretty white flowers in the spring, uh, berries for the birds, uh, and gorgeous, you know, this gorgeous red foliage. Um, another example, other examples that are the same, other alternatives. Father Giller, the, the Father Giller, there's a dwarf Father Giller and a Father Giller major that have the most incredible fall color and pretty bottle brush flowers in, this, in the spring. Uh, the, the foliage of this looks reddish in this, but it's red, orange, and yellow, and purple in the same shrub. They're fantastic. Highbush blueberries uh, obviously have wildlife value for the berries uh, uh, if you don't get them all yourself. <laughs> and uh, Virginia sweet spire, Ikea virginica here, this is another beautiful plant uh, that has gorgeous fall foliage and pretty flowers for pollinators. So there are alternatives. Uh, out there to, to some of these invasive uh, plants. Um, this is one that I really wanted to show you uh, because it's particularly uh, widespread and getting more widespread and it's called black swallow wart. And it's a, it's a vine, uh, it's in the milkweed family. Um, it attracts monarch butterflies for that reason to lay their eggs on it, on the leaves. But the, the caterpillars, they cannot eat the leaves, so they die. So it's kind of this dastardly imposter. Um, so this poor monarch butterfly that we're trying to save everywhere because it's so iconic and endangered and has an epic migratory journey, it's being waylaid by this black swallow wart vine. So if you see it, you get out your, your dandelion weeder or a big long screwdriver or something and just go right under the surface, you'll find a root system just like this. Uh, that's some white roots and probably one of them is attached to another plant somewhere. But if you can get out this, this bit of uh, white roots, um, you will have done a good job toward eliminating the plant in your yard, put it in a plastic bag and throw it out in the trash. Don't compost it or throw it out with your yard waste because it just spreads the problem elsewhere. You'll see that the, the plant, just like a milkweed, if you're familiar with milkweed, it will develop a pod. Um, and then that pod will dry and open up and then the seeds will fly everywhere. And they particularly love to uh, claim space around chain link fences, which makes it really difficult to get rid of them, or in hedges, like in privet hedges. Um, so if you would, I would appreciate it. You'd make my work easier if you can uh, take care of the black swallow wart in your yard, if you have any. It has a little black flower, which isn't very pretty. Um, when I first moved into the area, I lived in Belmont and I had one of these and I used to call it the Belmont Strangler. And those of you that are not from the area will, <laughs> will know that um, we had a, there was a, a strangler who lived in the Belmont area. So we, we called him the Belmont Strangler. <laughs> That's what I call this plant. All right, let's get onto a nicer topic, which is how to incorporate water into your landscape. So the last thing that really plants need uh, besides uh, food and, and safety is water. Um, depending on the size of your yard, uh, see what you can take care of and what you want to take care of. And so different options, anywhere from a small bird bath to a fountain, um, to a pond, if you have the space. Um, these are all places that, that uh, insects and birds and small animals can get some water. So just pay attention to what you want to attract and the kind of water that you provide. Um, so insects will just, uh, I feel like butterflies will just need something very shallow. So a shallow saucer like, like um, here we go, like this uh, will feed your butterflies um, and bees and uh, something a little deeper for birds. And then uh, if you have something at a little larger, you may be able to attract some, some amphibians um, to your yard. Um, I have a small bird bath that I clean every few days uh, with an old dishwashing brush that I keep hidden in the plants below the bird bath. So I just take it out. I don't have to go look for it, it's right there. Um, the blue, geez, blue jays and the robins uh, like to bathe and knock all the water out of it, but I happily clean it and refill it just to watch this fantastic show. Um, the goldfinches, the chickadees, the cardinals all come to drink. And it's just satisfying to see them. They're so beautiful. I'll show you a picture of my bird bath in just a second. Um, it, you have to make sure that you keep the water clean. Uh, so 
so you have to maintain it. it it's not good it's not healthy for the wildlife to have dirty water and it smells terrible so if you have bird bath, bird baths just clean the, the vessel and refresh the water every couple of days and if you have a small fountain or a pond just clean them seasonally so let's show you what i got here in my yard um okay let me go that was i was just talking about that slide um so um in my yard, I have, this is my water feature, really huge. <laughs> it's just a, a saucer, um, a, a, a ceramic glazed saucer. It actually has an unglazed rim. Uh, and uh, it's, it's only a couple inches deep, maybe know, two and a half, three inches at most. Um, and I put it on some kind of a, I, I saw some, one of these in somebody else's yard. I don't know what it is, some piece of machinery that uh, is, is rusting and, uh, it just has the perfect spot for this, this saucer to sit on. So that's what my bird bath is in my yard. Um, and I found this somewhere, I don't even know where I got it. Um, and you can see that the plantings around this bird bath are very dense. Um, and there are some trees nearby so the birds can come and check out the safety first before they come in for a bath or for a drink. I do have roaming cats in my neighborhood. Um, so they've been able to get away quickly. I, have, I haven't found any dead birds. Um, and lots of birds use the bird bath. So I guess it's a pretty good setup. They say often to put your bird bath kind of out in an open area, but um, right on the other side of this, of these trees uh, is a pretty steep drop. Um, so the, the cats don't tend to go in there very much. And I've also sighted this directly opposite my kitchen window so I can see it easily um, at all times of year. And I leave it up all times of year too. Um, and just to show you sort of what I've done in my yard too, uh, you can see that it's, I have a small lawn. It's not much bigger than this. I'll show you a view from the other side in a second. Um, and um, it's, it's surrounded by a, a border that's very multi-layered. So a lot of ground cover uh, and not all my plants are native. I've started planting about 15 years ago and native was not such a big thing. I thought people were sort of fanatics. Since then, I'm, I'm, I've become much more convinced, although I'm not a fanatic and I don't have everything native. Um, but I've been adding uh, over the course of the year. And the plants are tough and they are um, very rabbit resistant. And I'll talk a little more, more about that and what you can do. Um, but a lot of ground cover, perennial layer, shrub layer, and understory tree layer. I had to take out some large trees that were not very stable, some box elders. Um, so I have a lot more sun now, but I have a big birch in the front that someone gave me at about 18 inches high, and now it's about 35 feet tall. And um, the, the, the uh, particularly the goldfinches love that. Um, and I'm gonna have some show off pictures because the spring was really gorgeous for the garden. And um, particularly these roses, these beautiful apricot roses that smell like heaven, um, we're very happy. And they're in the middle of ground covers and they have all kinds of plants around them. Uh, this blue, blue uh, star, uh, Amsonia uh, blue ice is a great ground cover. It has an incredibly deep root system. It lasts through anything. Uh, don't try to move it. You'll never get down deep enough because uh, it's a prairie grass and it really roots really go down there. But the Coreopsis reticulata, um, there's some peonies. Uh, there are some, uh, this is a witch hazel. So all kinds of things are all mixed together and different kinds of shrubs. If I saw carpus and nine bark shrub, this is a um, mock orange and different kinds of different layers. And so within this area, you know, the little creatures are very happy because they have a lot of areas that I don't go into. Um, I go in there every once in a while and just see if anything's growing that shouldn't be growing and pull it out if I have to. There's lots of eye candy for me and lots of variety. And this is it from the other view. You can see my husband sitting under our um, umbrella because we had to get an umbrella because we don't have the trees anymore. Um, and so you can see the lawn is, is uh, not very big. It's a little mottled looking and I don't really care. Sometimes it looks more green, sometimes it's not. Sometimes I water it a little if it gets pretty brown looking. Um, but uh, it's not really that important to me. I'm looking more at what's around it. Um, and my neighbors are quite close by, as you can see. So I, I have a lot of screening and I do it with plants. Um, this is just a view of the shrubs giving a, and small trees giving us some, some privacy and also food, food for the animals. 
And you may remember if some of you may have seen the uh, a Zoom I did last year about this meadow, um, this pollinator meadow I did on Bow Street, uh, 39 Bow Street, and it's right on the sidewalk. So you can just drive by and take a look. This is the third year. Um, and um, you can see how to incorporate a strip for wildlife uh, along the, the uh, sidewalk if you want to um, in your yard and take up. This takes up a thousand square feet of what would be lawn. Um, and now it's now food for birds and insects. Um, this year, the pale coneflower, this Echinacea pallida, which is a really interesting coneflower. The, the petals are very light pink and they, they tend to droop down. Um, the first couple of years, it, the first year was completely eaten. And these are all put in as plug sizes, uh, landscape plugs. The first year it was eaten almost completely uh, by rabbits along with asters. Um, and then uh, because there are a lot of things around it that the rabbits don't like to eat, uh, various kinds of cat mint, different kinds of things. Um, it's gotten a couple years to recover and now it's blooming quite a bit and it's really looking fun uh, in there. Um, so it takes a while for this kind of planting ma to mature. Um, and then there are volunteers. Uh, like I found blue flag iris uh, in here that I didn't plant. Blue flag iris is a native wetland plant. And there are some wetlands nearby, just behind here is a uh, Catalda reservation that I take care of. So right along Millbrook, um, there is blue flag iris because like, I planted it. I don't know if it comes from there, but somehow it got in here. Um, and then this year, uh, I didn't take a picture. Oh, you can see here a little bit. Some, some tall things are growing. I realize it's cattails. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, and are we going to let that cattail stay? I don't think so because I don't want cattails to start to dominate. Um, but it's a really good example of learning to manage um, your property rather than maintain. Because when you maintain, main, maintenance kind of uh, implies everything stays the same. So everything has to be uh, clipped and um, separated and, uh, and, and look the same every year. But this kind of planting, um, or even my yard, uh, I really just manage it. So if something comes in that I don't want because a bird brought it in, I say, okay, I don't want that mulberry tree because we have mul a lot of mulberry trees in the neighborhood. And I don't particularly want a mulberry tree here. If I wanted a mulberry tree in a corner of the yard, I would leave the mulberry and let it grow up and be a mulberry tree. Um, but I manage it so that I work together with uh, with the, with nature to to keep something that pleases me to look at and invites this wildlife to come in. Um, and it's much less work and it does not require a lot of chemicals. And I think it's much more satisfying. Um, so how can we coexist with this wildlife and still feel safe in our yards? So you really just need to be informed about these wild animal insect habits and habitats and uh, use fencing if necessary. I mean, if you have deer in your area and you can't grow anything, put some deer fencing up. Um, or if, you're, you're, if the groundhogs are going after your vegetables, uh, give them a barrier that they can't get through. Um, give animals time at night. So a lot of animals come out at night, just let them roam and they'll, they won't necessarily stay there. Or if, they, if they do and you have a problem, you know, you have to call someone, but um, you can respect their habits. We need to get along with them. Don't approach them, um, just observe them from a safe distance and don't feel the, feed the wild animals. I, they just become dependent on you and you don't need to do that. So keep your garbage can tightly closed and your compost bins closed if you put food in it. I don't even put food in my compost anymore. I'm, I, I use black earth composting now and it's, I think it's great. It doesn't cost that much and you can put your, your food uh, to good use. Um, keep your pets safe. We know that some of these wild critters um, like to go after pets. And just if mosquitoes are a problem, just avoid being out, outdoors during that activity season, dusk, activity time, dusk and dawn, and avoid standing water. Uh, which breeds mosquitoes. This is really important and it's really easy to miss. Um, so I said I would talk about what plants. This is my last, almost last slide, next to last slide. Um, so what plants do rabbits and deer tend to avoid um, unless there's nothing better to eat, which they will probably eat anything. 
So it's pretty easy list um, and you'll get used to this after a while. Some things, things that are spiky like yucca, um, flowers that don't taste good to them or are toxic. So uh, the hellebore, Lenten rose, they don't eat them. Foxglove, monkshood, these are toxic. Um, they don't like epimedium, a barren wart or a barren strawberry. They don't like a stillbees, snake root, actea, um, or wild ginger I have found. And leaves and flowers with strong smells, particularly like mints and lavenders and yarrows. Uh, that's like uh, any sage or salvia, uh, lavender, bee balm. They don't go after these things, lemon balm. Um, the mountain mints, which are uh, not that common in people's yards. Uh, they can tend to get fairly large, but uh, if you have space for them, they're wonderful plants. Any of the alliums, cat mints, uh, wild geraniums, I don't have them eating any of these plants in my yard. Um, leaves that are fuzzy or leathery, uh, like yarrow, like anemones, vinca. They don't need vinca. Vinca is not a native, and I wouldn't necessarily plant it by choice, but if you have it, uh, if they don't eat it. And they don't like ferns. They don't like ladies' mantle or artemisia, lungworts, succulents. So there's a, a pretty big list of plants that you can use. Plants with stems that are sappy, like the Amsonia has a milky sap. Uh, milkweed is the same thing. Um, any euphorbia. Uh, they don't like Solomon seal. So these plants are, are uh, pretty rabbit proof in most situations where I've done planting. Um, so if, if you like this, take a, take a snapshot of this, uh, this page. And then there's another um, link here uh, for, for perennials that, um, but you can also look up rabbit proof perennials or deer proof of plants and get lots and lots of lists of plants that are, that are really, uh, easy to find, and uh, we'll keep the rabbits from devouring everything. So last words, um, some final words from our neighbor in Concord, Mr. Thoreau. What's the use of a fine house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? So don't be afraid of nature. Celebrate your membership and support others in the family. So we're all in it together. Okay, thanks. That's uh, that's all I've got, Ashley. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. And hopefully, I can answer if you have any. Um, <clears throat> I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on all of these things, but I've just been trying to share some of my successes with you, which was wonderful. It was great to hear and really interesting. Um, okay, we have three questions. Do you find that mosquito dunks are a good for the environment and an effective control mechanism? Yes. Yes, I do too. Matter of fact, I, I don't use them myself because I don't keep standing water, but, um, but I have heard that using mosquito mosquito dunks is the most effective way to eliminate mosquitoes in your in your yard. Um, if you live right next to a wetland, a uh, wet area that's not in your yard, you may have a little bit more trouble, but um, and might have to just avoid certain times of day. But uh, for most people have told me that uh, that mosquito dunks are the most effective way to, to eliminate the mosquito larva before they have a chance to hatch. Yeah, That's I agree with that. Um, and I noticed someone here says he uses it in his bird bath. I use it more in a wetland and you don't have to use that much, but we don't have mosquitoes, but we really? do have a lot of frogs. And you, uh, live next, you live next to a wetland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You mentioned catmen. Are there other plantings that can resist eradication by rabbits? You just gave a whole long list. Yeah, yeah. I and I would you. definitely recommend the ones with strong smells. I mean, for instance, I do Nicotiana occasionally as an annual. Boy, the rabbits don't go near it. I put it right at the edge of the garden and they don't even come into that garden now. And that's a, that's a member of the, of the um, uh, what is it? Nightshade family, because it's a tobacco. Right. I remember the nightshade family when those leaves are toxic. Yeah. Tomatoes, uh, you know, all these things that that tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. So those are all nightshades, and they don't, so they don't eat them. There yeah. was a speaker at a garden club lecture recently, and she showed her garden with had nine, eight deer in it, and so she ran out and got ill morganite, which is. Um, a Minnesota product that's been going since the 40s and it is dried human waste. Looks like cornmeal. Um, she's found it very effective. The deer hate it. They don't like the smell. There is no smell. It's also a very effective um, fertilizer, she recommended. She also said the 
deer don't like it. Oh, I'm getting something behind. Am I still here? You've gone incognito. What's that? It, 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 she's still sharing her screen, so it's just. Oh, oh, I was looking at Mill Organite. <laughs> yeah. um, we got it, and New England Nursery has it, and we found that it so far and it's worked brilliantly, and it does not smell. It looks like brown cornmeal. Uh, now people are going, "Ooh, it's human waste," and then they look at it and say, "That's not so bad." Mm -hmm. um, so. It's, it's another possibility. Uh, we are really over our time, so I want to be careful. But I, one of the things that I think you mentioned, which I strongly believe in, is the way you plant. Um, massing plants mm -hmm. is so much easier. Uh, my garden gets sort of overwhelmed because I'm so massed at times. Yeah. But I yeah. don't have the weeds. I don't have all the stuff, and I have a lot of happy caterpillars, etc. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, massing is great. And if you have plants that spread, like the bee balm, will spread naturally. You know, and you, if it doesn't, it spreads more than you want. Then you just can dig a little bit out of that area and share it with a friend, right? And put it somewhere else. <laughs> put it somewhere put it somewhere else. Somewhere else. Yep, exactly. So thank you, Holly, for being. Uh, people are so lucky to hear from a true landscaper and a conservationist about what to do and how to handle this. I think it's a dynamite lecture. Thank Next you. week, we will have Shelly Henderson, who will talk about the Lexington Field and Garden Club's islands and how to take care of them. Mm. The club was incorporated in 1891, and back then they were even taking care of the traffic islands that you see because those people then wanted to make Lexington look more beautiful. And so you will see- Shelly takes, Shelly takes care of a beautiful, Shelly takes care of a beautiful uh, island at the corner of Lowell and Summer Streets uh, in East Lexington. Yes, so, she does. That's yeah, right. That's very pretty. And her recommendations, I think, would help with anybody who is um, also gardening close to the street and what you can do when you're close to a street, such as I am on a busy street, you know, because not all plants can manage a very busy street with the snow plows and everything else during the winter. So I recommend you seeing that and you got Holly's name. And if you need any help, there she is. And everybody stay cool. And Holly, you were, I hope you can go turn on an air conditioner and run in. I'm trying to get rid, can you see? <laughs> Taking care of yeah. it, Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Ashley. I, I think we gotta let Holly uh, go get into the air conditioning. That's yeah. what she um, It was, you know, it was funny. It was the, I had noticed it earlier, and then when other people were mentioning it, I, I'm glad you picked it up as the air conditioner. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was worried about. Okay, and I, I, in no way I can change that. So.